At the 1939 World's Fair in New York, television was the shining example of the marvels of technology. Hiya, bud. Hiya. Now just act and talk naturally. Oh, is it going? It's on. Hiya, folks. This is Clark Gable Middleton speaking. As you can see, if you've got your television set to stand on. And later, concerts in miniature. But in its infancy, television was incapable of covering the most important news story of the century. World War II would be the finest hour for another medium, radio. And one radio reporter with his wartime broadcasts would set the standard by which every television and radio reporter would be judged. Hello, America. This is Ed Morrow speaking from London. It's about the people I'd like to talk. The little people who live in those little houses. Edward R. Murrow would convert the radio into the most compelling news machine of the war. Being bombed again. The sound of gunfire has been rolling down these crooked streets like thunder. Half an hour ago, I could read street signs in the flash of anti-aircraft batteries. Television news was born in a radio tube. Marked the point where shrapnel fell. I don't think there has ever been a journalist like Murrow who's come along. And I suppose that is because he started it. Murrow started the whole concept of radio news evolving into television news. He was our model. He was an idol. And I think that as long as I was a broadcaster, I tried to emulate what I thought he would do. And I think a lot of other people did too. I began to see what was happening to Berlin. The 4,000 pound high explosives were bursting below like great sunflowers gone mad. The small incendiaries were going down like a fistful of white rice thrown on a piece of black velvet. Murrow was a wonder. He had a very special talent for painting pictures with words. No one ever did it better. People said of John Ruskin in the last century, you'd rather read John Ruskin's description of Venice than go to Venice itself because he was better. Well, Murrow was better than the war. And he really brought the war home to the American people. Murrow revolutionized electronic news by hiring people not because they were polished radio performers, but because they were intelligent. Before Murrow, news on the radio consisted of an announcer with a baritone voice who didn't know what he was talking about, reading a few lines written by an underpaid wire service reporter who didn't know what he was talking about. Well, things got exciting in Europe. Murrow and White instituted the World News Roundup, and they hired reporters who brought an awful lot more to a news report than any other person could do. It was very good. I think what their main achievement was, they took the medium radio away from the announcers and gave it to reporters. And when television swept across the country in the post-war prosperity, the radio reporters thought it was merely an entertainment box, hardly the place for serious news. I think we rather snobbishly felt we were superior to pictures and showmanship. We were not vaudevillians, we were reporters. The makers of Camel Cigarettes bring the world's latest news events right into your own living room. Sit back, light up a camel, and be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 hours. When Camel Cigarettes advertised on our news program, they earnestly requested that we never show a picture of anybody smoking a cigar. They earnestly, <laughs> they earnestly requested that during the news program, Swayze sitting at a desk, have a cigarette lit and smoking in an ashtray here beside him. Glad we could get together. John Cameron Swayze saying good night for Camo Cigarette. Once in a while when Swayze was away or sick or on vacation or whatever, I filled in for him. And the only thing they asked me to do that I didn't much care for, but I did it, was at the end of the program on Friday nights, I pick up a carton of Camel cigarettes and say, we, have, we are happy to say that we have, I'm sort of ad-living here, that we have sent 150,000 cartons of camel cigarettes to our boys overseas. Sir Winston Churchill came in here today looking as fine and fit as ever, his face pinker than a The baby. producers sought permission from the sponsors to show a picture of Winston Churchill. He did smoke a cigar. 
zipper. And I saw the man in charge of our program, who was a vice president, I am sure, and it was very friendly. I'd met him before, and it took me about 30 seconds to make my case, and he said, sure. And so I said, thank you. And I got up to leave. It was down on 42nd Street, and I had to get way uptown again. As I got to the door, and I said, how about Groucho Marx? And he said, no. Uh, the, it finally became apparent to the powers that be in, in network news that if you were advertised by a cigarette, for instance, how in the world could you possibly do a proper story about the tobacco industry? Uh, and the same was true if you were sponsored by Oldsmobile. What are you going to do? Go after General Motors? For the audience, it was sometimes difficult to know what was a commercial and what was a news story. It's the new thrill, that futuramic Oldsmobile with the new rocket engine. Now, to New York's famous Hotel Waldorf Astoria for important news about Plymouth. In the heart of New York City, the executives of Plymouth are being honored with an award that's without precedent in automobile history. So, to Mr. John P. Mansfield, president of Plymouth, it is my privilege to present this medallion. 